Good morning. First, I want to thank uh, the House Democrats and their 2024 Issues Conference and our Chairman Pete Aguilar, as well as our House Democratic Caucus leadership uh, for this convening and the opportunity uh, to be here this morning. I'm Stephen Horsford. I represent Nevada's 4th Congressional District and serve as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. I'm pleased to be joined uh, today by my tri-caucus colleagues, Representative Judy Chu, Chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, and Representative Nanette Barragan, Chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, to discuss our efforts to push back against the recent attacks on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the wake of the Supreme Court ruling on affirmative action last summer. Since that ruling, the conservative right has engaged in an all-out assault on diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives in the corporate sector, in government, and beyond. Figures like Ed Blum, the architect of the affirmative action cases last summer, Stephen Miller, and American First Legal, among others, are engaged in a false and misleading anti-DE&I campaign. Blum has taken his fight from the Supreme Court to organizations like the Fearless Fund, a black women-owned venture capital firm that provides seed funding to small businesses owned by black women and women of color. Blum's federal lawsuit against the Fearless Fund alleges that the firm engages in discrimination for providing capital to black women-owned businesses, despite the fact that small businesses owned by black women and women of color receive near negligible shares of all venture capital investments. Additionally, a federal judge in Tennessee struck down a provision in the Small Business Administration's 8A Business Development Program, which now threatens billions of dollars in government contracting for historically disadvantaged groups. And since the ruling, 13 Republican Attorney Generals, led by the Alabama uh, Attorney General, sent a letter to corporate America threatening them and Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas issued letters to more than 50 corporate law firms claiming that diversity and equity initiatives promote discrimination, alleging that their clients, DE&I's programs, may be in violation of federal civil rights laws. Now, following the tragic murder of George Floyd in the summer of 2020, corporations around the country pledged 
more than $20 billion towards racial equity and strengthening their internal diversity equity practices. The attacks that we are seeing on diversity, equity, and inclusion are happening in spite of the fact that the overwhelming majority of Americans believe that corporations who made these pledges in 2020 and before were doing the right thing. These attacks are happening in spite of the fact that the majority of Americans believe that diversity initiatives in the workplace are simply good for business. And these attacks are happening in spite of the fact that the research out of business institutions like McKinsey, BCG, Forbes, and others has proven now for years that diversity is good for business. In fact, McKinsey's recently released report, 2023, Diversity Matters Even More, in, their, in that report it found that companies in the top quartile for diversity of their management are 39% more likely to outperform their peers. That's empirical data. For the past several months, the Congressional Black Caucus has been working to hold the line against these attacks on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and other economic um, initiatives such as the 8A program, and are working to call out what is painfully obvious. The attacks on DE&I are an attack on all of our communities. They are an attack on equity. Last summer, the Congressional Black Caucus got out of Washington and went into 14 cities across the country through our Democracy for the People initiative, hearing directly from our constituents just how important these issues are to them. And this past summer, the Congressional Black Caucus issued an open corporate accountability letter to Fortune 500 companies who made public racial equity and DE&I commitments, again, since the summer of 2020 and before. And we simply asked these companies to affirm their commitments in the face of these attacks. We have set a deadline for corporations to respond to our letter, updating us on their progress and asking them to recommit themselves to their pledges by Monday, February 12th. Since issuing our letter, the Congressional Black Caucus has engaged extensively with corporate America on this issue and we look forward to aggregating the information that we receive, some of which uh, we will make public. In response to our request, those companies will provide formal written responses to the Congressional Black Caucus next week. Our ongoing engagement has been collaborative in nature. We have responded to hundreds of emails about our accountability request, held more than 50 meetings with corporate leaders, and convened a call with over 300 company representatives to discuss how we can move this issue forward together. We are eager to receive the formal responses and to make an assessment about the strength of corporate America's commitment to addressing racial inequities and diversity, equity, and inclusion practices and policies. We also know that this is work, that this work is really just only beginning. So our message to corporate America and to those who made DEI pledges is we want to work with you. We stand firm to do the right thing and then to work with us to help close the racial wealth gap in America and create economic opportunity for everyone. Our message to those who wish to see us with less access to econ economic opportunities and capital, we know what you are doing. We will continue to call you out, and we will not stop fighting back or be silent. As the conscience of the Congress, the Congressional Black Caucus, and our partners in the Congressional Tri Caucus cannot and will not sit back and allow these conservative actors and their ideo uh, ideologies to win. We will not allow them to use their tactics of initiating lawsuits to intimidate or scare others as their anti DEI efforts take hold to, to be a detriment to the communities that we all represent. In the coming months, we look forward to keeping all of you apprised of our efforts. And again, I wanna thank uh, my colleagues for their leadership on this important issue and how it impacts their communities as well. I'll turn it over to Chairwoman Judy Chu. Hello, I'm Congress Member Judy Chu, 
from California's 28th District and Chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, or what we call KPAC. I'm so grateful to be here alongside my fellow Tri-Caucus leaders and colleagues, including CBC Chair Steve Horsford and CHC Chair Nanette Barragan. And I am here to announce KPAC's letters, our letters, to the Fortune 100, asking them to respond to our questions with regard to corporate diversity regarding AANHPIs, or Asian American, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. And we will be sending this letter out to all of them shortly. The Tri Caucus stands together to speak out against attacks on diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DENI, initiatives across the country. Now, before I entered public service, I taught at community colleges for 20 years. I know that not all students are afforded equal opportunity in our education systems. And I know that students learn best when they encounter diversity in the classroom. Holistic, race-conscious admissions policies allow all students, regardless of race or ethnicity, to be able to tell the full story of who they are and live in a thriving multiracial democracy. This principle holds true in all other sectors, from service academies to corporations. We know that being exposed to and being a part of a tremendous mosaic of experiences, perspectives, and backgrounds is beneficial to everyone. But we know that not all young people, especially people of color, are afforded equal opportunity in our education systems, nor in business, politics, arts, and beyond. That's why the Supreme Court ruling that gutted race-conscious admissions policies at universities last year was devastating for our communities. For AA and HPI communities, make no mistake, this ruling was a loss. Our students are not a monolith, and those who come from low-income, first-generation, immigrant, refugee, or indigenous backgrounds who are already systematically denied equal opportunity in education are now encountering even more hurdles to acceptance. That's why we stood with our Tri-Caucus colleagues immediately after the decision to reaffirm our commitment to fighting for the right of every student to reach their full potential. And the relentless attacks on DEI have not stopped there, especially since the affirmative action ruling, we've seen countless attempts by House Republicans to gut DEI programming and work wherever they can, uh, including across federal agencies. These assaults on DEI are rooted in the same fears that led to the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, the alien land laws stripping Chinese and Japanese immigrants of land ownership rights, and the murder of Vincent Chin by laid off auto workers in 1982. In other words, the undermining of DEI efforts relies on the erasure of the racist and xenophobic history our communities have ha faced in this country and the generational impacts it's left behind. And make no mistake, these attacks on programs to help foster diversity and equity in our society are not just misguided. They are direct assaults on communities of color, on women, on our LGBTQ communities, and much more. Despite representing 12% of the U.S. professional workforce, AA and HPIs only comprise about 4% of directors of Fortune 1000 companies and are the least likely racial group to be promoted into management roles. That is why KPAC's leadership members are sending letters to America's Fortune 100 companies to understand their corporate diversity efforts in relationship to AA and HPI communities. This effort will build on a similar letter that KPAC sent in 2016 requesting this information, which asks for their statistics on AAPIs, on uh, senior management roles, on their efforts in supporting the communities, on their subcontracting with AA and HPI communities, and so forth. And we appreciate our partnership with CBC, which has done similar things over the past months as well, in terms of letters being sent to corporations. In 2020, 
Our nation witnessed the murder of George Floyd, and Asian Americans began to fear for their safety in a wave of anti-Asian hate unleashed by the pandemic and the disgraced former president's description of COVID-19 as Kung Flu and the China virus. With Americans demanding a racial reckoning because of these tragedies, corporations pledge to better address racial injustice. We want to see if they followed through on those promises and encourage them to continue this important work, even in the face of assaults on DEI from our Republican colleagues. We must preserve and further invest in DEI efforts in all sectors so that all communities can reach their full potential. That's why I stand here today with my colleagues in the Tri Caucus and with Black, Latino, Native American, and AANHPI communities across the nation to loudly say, we will continue to encourage corporations and universities to do meaningful outreach to communities of color and underserved communities and ensure that those already in their classrooms and offices feel welcome. We will demand robust federal funding and support for minority serving institutions and program serving communities of color. And we will continue to protect our communities against extremist efforts to turn back time, resegregate our society, and pit us against each other. Thank you. And now I'd like to turn the podium over to our outstanding and energetic chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, Nanette Barragan. Well, good afternoon. Um, thank you. It's uh, great to be here to join my, uh, my, um, my colleagues to have the Tri Caucus um, stand firm uh, to promote and defend diversity and inclusion policies. Um, I think uh, this goes to show the importance of why it's important the Tri Caucus work together. Because when we get together and we fight for common interest, our power is stronger, whether that's in the Congress on policy, uh, whether that's uh, holding corporate uh, America accountable. Um, we know that's where the power lies. And so uh, the Hispanic Caucus is to c committed to working together uh, to build a nation where everyone can thrive regardless of their ethnicity, or their race, or their background. And we know that DEI is not just a checkbox. It's a commitment toward a more just and prosperous future for all. Um, as was mentioned, I won't repeat it all. Um, we have definitely seen the attacks since uh, the George Floyd uh, incidents. We've certainly seen the attacks um, since the Supreme Court decision. Um, and we hear pol politician rhetoric, uh, which is another attack and division amongst um, those in leadership that have a harmful and dangerous approach. But look at having people, having diverse uh, opinions and diverse people at the table, I think is part of what America is about. It's the beauty of America. And it makes better policy. It makes better business. And it's the right thing to do. Um, we we got to continue to fight back. I think about the vote that happened um, uh, just, I think it was last year, where uh, we had a vote in the Congress to eliminate the uh, diversity and inclusion officer at the Pentagon, which happened to be one of our own, uh, Gil Cisneros, right? It, it is this attack is continuing at all levels, and we have to stand up to continue to fight against it, but also to hold corporate America accountable. The Hispanic Caucus issued a statement of support after the Black Caucus wrote its letter um, to uh, corporate America because this is a, a common shared interest. So. We're going to continue to fight for the diversity and inclusion policies um, and making sure that they um, are defended and then making sure that we don't lose sight of the value of why um, it's so important to have that diversity and inclusion. I often think of the phrase that people say, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And that sums up one of the reasons why we have to continue to fight for these. Thank you. Thank you. I will be happy to take a, a couple of questions. Congress Please Ford. identify yourself. Yeah. Ryan Henson, Gray TV. This question is directed for you, but obviously we're here for you to respond. But um, I know the CDC and FDA worked hard to get minority entrepreneurs a lot of capital, over a billion dollars last year, if my math's correct. What's the plan to continue that momentum and talk about why it's important to uplift uh, the economy and minority communities mm -hmm. overall? Well, first, um, I was pleased just uh, a week ago Saturday to have the vice president and the SBA Administrator Isabel Guzman in my district 
uh, to promote a number of efforts and resources that the SBA and the Minority Business Development Agency, the first time actually Democrats helped to secure the permanent authorization of the MBDA and the permanent uh, placement of the undersecretary. Why? Because the amount of small businesses in America are booming. We actually have seen 16 million new businesses started in the last few years. A large percentage of those businesses are entrepreneurs of color. Um, and we need to make sure that they have access to capital, opportunities for contracting, uh, the ability to you know, sell their products and, and services both in the government and with the private sector. That's why these attacks against diversity, equity, and inclusion. So th those elements include the workforce, they include the C-suite, they include uh, boards of directors, but they also include the businesses that we are helping uh, to, to establish and to grow. And we just want to make sure that uh, these, uh, these attacks don't diminish the opportunity. Um, under the SBA, just in the last three years, the number of SBA loans to black entrepreneurs has doubled. That is the commitment that the Biden-Harris administration has had in working with uh, the Tri-Caucus and House Democrats broadly, but it's about putting the, the interest of people over politics and making sure that we have the opportunities to create uh, business and, uh, and entrepreneurship like any other communities. Well, I'm a member of the House Small Business Committee, so we talk about this quite a bit. And uh, what I want to say is that the Biden administration is very committed to making sure that there is greater access to cap capital to minority entrepreneurs. You know, 70% um, of those who seek access to capital are turned away by, by conventional banks. And so this is a serious problem. And that's why we have to have programs will, that will open up the capital to our underserved businesses. Um, and so that's why, for one thing, it was very important to make the Minority Business Development Agency permanent. This is one agency that focuses on ensuring that we get the capital to the businesses that have high potential and, and ne truly need it. But there are also other programs of the SBA that have tried to make sure that more of our underserved businesses get the capital that they need. The most popular program of the SBA is the 7A program uh, because of the flexibility in, in uh, how you utilize that. But underserved businesses have even been turned away for 7A loans. And that's why there's something called Community Advantage, which has specifically targeted the underserved businesses, those who may not have the assets or the credit history or the length of time on their business. Uh, the Community Advantage Program allows for somewhat greater risk in terms of providing the loans to underserved um, businesses. And um, it has, and, and also provides technical help so they can survive. So uh, this program has been very successful in ensuring that more underserved businesses actually get the loans that they need. And I have to give real credit to our SBA administrator, Isabel Guzman, because she's put forth a rule to make this program permanent. And if we have it on a permanent status, we can ensure that even more financial institutions will take up this loan. I also actually have a bill to make it permanent. I just want to chime in on one thing. Um, the, um, our ranking member, Anidi Velasquez, has been championing and making sure that there are efforts being made uh, so that there are minor more minority-owned contractors getting access to all the money that's, that's going out and the contracts that are going out and the barriers that we st continue to have amongst minority-owned businesses to get those contracts. And so that's another element that I think we're continuing to work on as well. I love your statement about when blacks are at the top or minorities are at the top, the companies grow. Wayne County of Michigan, I'm doing a survey, I don't know all the stats, got 600,000 600, new businesses during COVID and the exchange of money coming in. What do we need to do to make sure the message is getting out that the success is there? Mm -hmm. It's been proven. But unfortunately, sometimes, even in rooms like this, it's all white people telling the story, so they don't give that side of the story. So whether you're Asian, whether you're uh, Hispanic or black, how do we get 
for them to understand that their editors and their publishers need to tell the story that helps mm -hmm. with the growth of America for their safer community. Mm -hmm. Well, diversity, equity, and inclusion is in every sector, including the press corps. And the press and the freedom of the press is one of the most important cornerstones of our democracy. Having uh, a core that is representative of the communities that they are writing stories about, definitely uplifting the stories of the people who have been directly benefited. For example, when the vice president came to my district with the SBA administrator, we went to the Chef Jeff project to promote the fact that the SBA was eliminating the ban the box uh, provision, which now allows previously incarcerated individuals to have access to SBA loans so that they're not just uh, workers, they're actually helping to create jobs in their communities. That is, I think, an example of what we can be doing all across the country. I was, you know, discouraged to see a couple of major uh, news um, organizations just uh, let go a, a tremendous number of employees. I'm concerned about the impact of uh, uh, journalists of color, uh, particularly from uh, the, the National Association of Black Journalists and Hispanic Journalists, uh, because those are places where individuals are able to tell those stories in an authentic and real way that connect to the community. So I'm hopeful that we'll continue to, to hold everyone accountable in every sector, including journalism. I see the one in the back, Axios, and then... Mm -hmm. um, are you concerned about what that says about the party's priorities on social policy? Well, no, actually, I'm a member of the Armed Services Committee. I fought back uh, against the Matt Gates and amendments uh, attacking diversity, equity, and inclusion, the elimination of the diversity office, the defunding of uh, uh, supporting our service members. And in fact, uh, of the 18 most egregious uh, attacks, only four in, ended up in the final adopted NDAA, and even those were uh, revised significantly. What it says is the other side is more focused on making these uh, culture war issues and demagoguing uh, diversity than they are about promoting the needs and interests of our service members. When I talk to the service members and families in my district at Nellis Air Force Base or Creech Air Force Base, they're, they're talking to me about housing child care, mental health services, transition after they complete their service. They're not talking about uh, uh, how diversity and equity and inclusion is in any way uh, affecting their ability to serve. So it's the other side that has used this as a wedge issue that is attacking the underlying tenets, tenets of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And what we're saying collectively as a tri caucus is we're not going to allow that to go unanswered. I was with the president on Sunday. The president is very well suited uh, to be our commander in chief. And we're going to continue to focus on the issues that the American people are focused on. Uh, today, we're talking about economic opportunities that are under assault. Uh, they are under assault by people like Ed Blum and Stephen Miller, uh, with the backing of people like Donald Trump. And Donald Trump asked black America, what do you have to lose? And then when he got into office, he appointed the most extreme, conservative, ideologically driven uh, Supreme Court that has taken away people's fundamental rights, whether that's women's right to make her own health care decisions, access to college through affirmative action, uh, or other things, including uh, voting rights uh, that have not been upheld by the Supreme Court. Those are the issues that the majority of Americans are fo focused on, and that's the contrast that will be on the ballot in November. Final question. If I could just ask a question about New York City. Um, obviously, it's a very important district to further narrow um, the difference between Republicans and Democrats in Congress. And as you know, 17% of the district is, um, you know, are voters of, with Asian American background. Curious if your 
you know, counseling, uh, uh, Swazi or, or members of, of JPAC, are they talking to Swazi or how do you plan to address those voters who ultimately voted Republican in the, in the midterm? We are laser focused on New York 3. And actually, the, um, the voting population it is over 20% AAPI. So there is uh, a huge voting base there. Uh, we want to make sure that they get out to vote and, of course, that they vote for Tom Swasey. And that uh, requires um, a great deal of follow-up in language, so we are actually putting out in language campaign mailers. Uh, we have campaign workers who are there also uh, working in language uh, and targeting the messages that are important to those voters. And Tom Swazi has been making the rounds of all the different AAPI groups there. And guess what? He's even learned a few words of Chinese. Maybe he needs to improve it a little bit, but uh, he's trying, and people can see that he's trying. Thank you. Has the Senate GOP killing the border bill, will it help Democrats in the New York three race? What it says is they're not serious about fixing an issue as important as uh, securing our border, ensuring that it's strengthened, and they're not serious about fixing the immigration problem in this country. So. Uh, that is what it signifies the most, but the voters of New York 3, as the voters across the country, they'll determine the outcomes in these upcoming elections. Thank you all very much.
my check, my check, my check, my check, my check. Please join me here. Mr. Sherman? Yes. Please come.
I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today uh, to hear what we have to say about a very important issue and a crisis that's in this country. I know that there's so many issues uh, that you're all concerned about because a lot, there's a lot going on um, to attract you and to have you uh, cover. Uh, but I'd like to say, first of all, good afternoon to everyone, and again, thank you for coming. As we come together during this year's Democratic Issues Conference, committee Democrats are here today to sound the alarm on our nation's worsening affordable housing and homelessness crisis. Nationwide, there's a shortage of 14 million homes for rent or purchase, creating mounting affordability pressures. As a result, a record number of renters and homeowners are paying a greater share of their income on housing than ever before. That means that it's much over 30 percent. You're talking about 50 percent of income now that may be going for housing. Meanwhile, over 650,000 people experiencing are experiencing homelessness on any given night in the United States as millions more are just one crisis away from becoming homeless themselves. So let's be very clear. It doesn't have to be this way. Unfortunately, for far too long, federal spending on housing has lagged behind growing need among families. In fact, since 2019, the federal government has spent less than 1% of the entire federal budget on housing. This is absolutely unacceptable. The good news is Democrats really do care about housing. That's why when I was chair of the Housing Financial Services Committee, the last Congress, we worked closely with President Biden to draft the housing bill, the title of which was Build Back Better. The Build Back Better Act that would have invested over $150 billion in fair and affordable housing. While House Democrats passed the bill in short order, the Senate unfortunately did not, and housing investments were stripped from what became the Inflation Reduction Act that passed last year. So yes, we're disappointed that housing has continually been left on the cutting room floor, but this president and committee Democrats have not given up, and we're going to finish the job when it comes to affordable housing, while extreme MAGA Republicans continue their efforts to defund federal housing programs and seem to be more concerned with kissing up to the twice impeached, four times criminally indicted former President Trump than they are with housing, their own communities where homelessness is increasing. While Trump made very clear during his tenure that he wants to round up and arrest people simply because they're homeless, Democrats continue to offer effective and humane solutions. This Congress, I proudly reintroduced with many of my colleagues right here today, a massive legislative package that would represent the single largest and most comprehensive investment in fair and affordable housing in the United States history. This includes the Housing Crisis Response Act, which represents the housing investments that were previously included in Build Back Better Act, would invest more than $150 billion in fair and affordable housing investments to create nearly 1.4 million affordable and accessible homes, reduce housing costs for all, and help address stubborn core inflation. The next bill is the Ending Homelessness Act, which would end homelessness and significantly reduce poverty by transforming the Housing Choice Voucher Program into a federal entitlement so that every household who qualifies for this assistance could receive it. And then, of course, the Down Payment Toward Equity Act, which would help revive the dream of home ownership for all by providing $100 billion in direct assistance to help find and help first-time, first-generation home buyers cover down payments, closing costs, and buy down mortgage interest rates. 
So we were very pleased today when we heard Vice President Harris indicate very clearly that housing is the top priority. And as America enters closer to November, Democrats are making sure housing is treated as such. Right now, we're watching as the housing crisis is having major effects on our nation's economy. Based on the latest inflation data, housing costs made up nearly 70% of stubborn core inflation. Families across the country need to know that we're fighting every day to solve this urgent crisis and build on the economic progress Democrats have made under the Biden administration. In addition to its historic, to this historic legislation, as ranking member, I'm announcing today that I will be launching a new initiative to work alongside Democratic members in the House and local officials to lower the cost of development and reduce other local barriers to fair and affordable housing. This includes working with communities to improve building codes, streamline permitting processes, eliminate restrictive zoning, and other policies that only benefit those such as NIMBY that is not in my backyard, who seek to block housing progress. We know there are evidence-based solutions to end this crisis, and we've seen some communities put their solutions into action. For example, the city of Houston has adopted the Housing Fair uh, uh, First Model to end homelessness by launching highly effective outreach teams to get people into permanent supportive housing which has resulted in a 63% reduction in homelessness since 2011. That's more than any of the other 10 largest cities in the United States. And not only that, but it is more humane and effective than costly strategies that seek to criminalize people experiencing homelessness. So with that, I will call on my colleagues in Congress on both sides of the aisle to join me and my fellow committee Democrats to get my legislative housing package across the finish line and make safe, fair, and affordable housing a reality for all. With that, I'd like you to hear uh, from some of the other members of our Financial Services Committee and other committees that may have joined us here today. I first wanted to have Mr. Cleaver and I think he has not made it yet, uh, but he is the subcommittee chair of insur housing and insurance. So I'll move on to Congressman Sherman, uh, who is from the greater Los Angeles area. Please introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Brad Sherman from California's best name city, Sherman Oaks. And I've spent uh, 28 years on the Financial Services Committee under the leadership of Maxine Waters. Three big things. First, as uh, our past and future chairwoman stated, we need her Housing Crisis Response Act of 2023. Second, we need lower interest rates, and we need to see those soon. And third, as the future chairwoman pointed out, we have to deal with the NIMBYs who prevent the construction of affordable housing. All too often, cities are saying, well, yes, you can build housing here, four units an acre. You pencil that out, you build four mansions. Four mansions an acre is not a solution to the housing supply crisis. Uh, it, we have left this to local governments. My state is increasingly getting uh, cities to uh, have to change some of their calculus, and this is a national problem. Uh, we also have, as a part of that, the fiscalization of land use planning where the way cities are financed gives them an incentive to have malls and mansions. Why? Because those produce more tax revenue for the city while having less fire and police protection needs. We don't particularly need more malls and mansions. We need more single, fam single family and especially multifamily housing. A uh, couple of small things. One, HUD needs to because uh, is uh, has too high a rate for uh, homeowners uh, for a mortgage insurance, and the people who are uh, getting that mortgage insurance are almost overwhelmingly first-time home buyers and families of color. And uh, second, 
that insurance should not be required for the whole life of the loan. Once you have a, uh, a lot of equity in the home, uh, th that insurance is no longer needed to protect the lender. Uh, second, a very uh, specific issue, and that is uh, the HUD-VASH program, which provides uh, uh, housing to uh, veterans who are otherwise without housing. Unfortunately, this program is not available to uh, – it, well, it's made available based on your income, but they unfortunately count in that income the, the disability payments made to disabled veterans. And so we have a circumstance in our area where they're building housing on a VA facility conveniently located next to the VA hospital where the veterans who need hospital services most, those who are completely disabled, are barred because, unfortunately, our law counts in their income, uh, uh, their, uh, their VA disability benefits. Uh, I now have the pleasure of introducing, uh, I guess, Mr. Himes, a longtime member of our committee. Please introduce your full responsibility. Thank you, Brad. I'm uh, uh, Jim Himes from the America's most confusingly named town, Coscob, Connecticut. Um, and thank you, Ranking Member Waters, for calling us together to uh, address this really critical problem. Um, in the last Congress, um, before the House descended into ground zero of chaos and clown shows, um, I had the privilege of chairing the Select Committee on Economic Disparity and Fairness and Growth. And after two years of work and the production of a major report and a documentary, which I commend to you, Grit and Grace, watch it, um, at the very top of the list of the things that we thought we could do to actually help address economic disparity and fairness and growth in this country was to very substantially increase the supply of housing in the United States. Uh, we have a dramatic supply shortfall. And you need to spend about 10 minutes in a high school economics class to understand that if your supply is constrained, prices will be too high. And this is true at every single level, from those families that need the most affordable housing, certainly in my community, which is an affluent community, well up into the upper middle class where people not only can't afford the housing, but because they're paying 50 or 60 percent of their income, they are uh, giving things like medications and food and education short shrift. And of course, that's a way of uh, eating your seed corn and affecting the next generation's ability to have to live the American dream. So uh, I am so happy that the ranking member has decided to uh, really push this legislation, in particular, the Housing Crisis Act, which would make stunning levels of resources available to actually address the supply uh, problem. And, uh, and uh, it is time, frankly, for the committee to focus on that and for us to work with the Senate to get that passed. The second area, which both the ranking member and uh, Congressman Sherman have referred to, is NIMBYism. The reality is that we're a little constrained at the federal level. We can provide more resources for supply. We can provide more uh, subsidy for folks that might otherwise have a hard time paying the rent or buying their first home. But as long as local communities and states have zoning and local land use regulations that prohibit the construction of housing, there's not enough money in the world to solve this problem. Now, like so many economically vibrant areas in the United States, I don't have in my community a NIMBY problem. I have a banana problem. Banana stands for build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. <laughs> and as long as communities are stuck in the notion that it's going to forever alter the character of their communities or that, 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 you know, that, that somehow additional housing um, is going to be a problem for them, we will not solve this issue. And, and last thing I want to say is that all over the country, communities are demonstrating the fact that if you build, particularly density in the urban core, around transportation hubs, mixed income, mixed use developments, what you're doing is you're building vibrant neighborhoods that people want to move to. Four miles from my house in Stanford, Connecticut, we are building a city that is inclusive, that has mixed income, mixed retail, right on a major train line. That is the future, not just of our country, but of prosperity in the country. So again, thank you, Ranking Member Waters, for uh, really highlighting this issue. If we don't act on it, uh, we will not address the economic disparity that is the core of our party's reason for being. So thank you for your leadership on that issue. And uh, it appears that we have not yet been joined by Ms. Beatty. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce um, from uh, a state that will be getting a lot of attention in the very near future uh, and uh, chairman of the uh, Congressional Black Caucus, Congressman Horsford. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you. It's my honor uh, to join with my colleagues. First, to thank our chairwoman and ranking member Waters for hosting this conference. She also had the most uh, well-attended and uh, robust uh, panel discussion on housing, um, and really for your tireless advocacy for the issues that matter most uh, to Americans, like housing and housing affordability and the crisis. And I really want to commend you because under your leadership as chair of the Financial Services Committee, um, you made sure housing was at the forefront of the agenda. And sadly, uh, I serve on, I'm on the Financial Services Committee, the subcommittee on housing and insurance, and under Republicans, they've had one hearing on housing, this, this Congress. Um, and that just shows you their dysfunction, the fact that they're not really focused on the issues that matter most uh, to uh, constituents across the country, uh, and it's why uh, we're focused on winning back our majority and making uh, our priorities, which are the people's priorities, the agenda of the House. I want to commend uh, the leader for her work. I'm proud to uh, be a sponsor of all of her bills to address the housing crisis, including uh, the root causes of the crisis, including uh, the Housing Crisis Response Act, which provides $150 billion in fair and affordable and uh, investments. It would help create 1.4 million affordable and accessible homes. Nearly 300,000 families um, would be able to afford their rent under this legislation. So my district is in Las Vegas, Nevada's fourth district. I represent Las Vegas, North Las Vegas, and Central Rural Nevada. My district covers 50,000 square miles. It's one of the larger congressional districts geographically. It's diverse demographically, um, and what it is, it's, it's, it's the representation of America. And so in addition to focusing on housing in urban areas, we also need to affect, affect and improve housing in rural America as well. Uh, I also wanted to share with my colleagues that I literally just attended uh, the homeless uh, point in time count that we had um, with our local officials, and I went out five in the morning uh, with our officials, first responders, to count the homeless in our community. It was one of the most humbling things that I've done as an elected official uh, to not only um, see the need, we have over 7,000 unhoused people every night in Las Vegas, but to also hear about uh, the impact that that homelessness is having on their quality of life, on their health care, um, on, on their mental health and, and other issues. That's why we need the legislation like the Ending Homelessness Act, which would end homelessness and significantly reduce poverty across our nation and in my district. Um, it would help make the Housing Choice Voucher Program more easily accessible for the families and individuals who need it the most, and it would also ban housing discrimination based on a veteran status or the source of income, like those who get Social Security or disability uh, like Mr. Sherman was talking about. Another bill that would address the racial wealth, pro prosperity, and home ownership gaps that we see across the country is the ranking member's Down Payment Towards Equity Act, which would directly assist first-time, first-generation home buyers in purchasing their first home. Obviously, buying a home is building equity. Building equity is building a legacy. And building a legacy is being able to pass something down to our children and our children's children. Um, I'm the first in my family to buy a home and to have that equity be able to be passed down to my children. That's the legacy that I want to leave, and that's the legacy that this legislation seeks to advance for all Americans, regardless of their zip code, regardless of their background. So these are the priorities that Democrats will put forward now and when we're back in the majority, and I want to commend the ranking member and all of my colleagues for their tremendous uh, ag uh, advocacy on these issues. And now I'll turn it to the vice chair of the committee, Representative Sylvia Garcia. Thank you. I'm uh, Sylvia Garcia, and I'm from Houston. And um, I want to thank the ranking member for all her work on putting all these bills together. And obviously, like many of us here at, at the um, podium, uh, I, too, uh, a co-sponsor. And, you know, I'm going to keep it simple. Why are we doing this? Because it's important 
to not only have food on the table, but a roof over your head. And that crosses every sector, every state, everybody has that same dream. It's part of the American dream to be able to get a good job, to get an education, and to be able to afford your own home. In my community, we always take pride in saying, mi casa, su casa. I know y'all know Margarita, but I know you know. <laughs> but you also know mi casa, su casa, right? And it simply says, my house is your house. There's a huge sense of pride when somebody gets a home. You know, they they're feel like they're part of the fabric of the neighborhood. They're not only not, not, not just renting. They don't have to rely on, a, on a, uh, a, a landlord to decide whether or not it's time to cut the grass or to fix the roof. It's their home that they can take care of. So all of these bills combined help get us to that, whether it's to be able to buy a home, uh, whether it's able to just stay and get better rent or get rental assistance, whether it's just to ha keep programs to, to help house the homeless. It's all about it together. And that's why these pieces of legislation are so important. You know, I'm also sit on the Housing and Insurance Subcommittee, and he's absolutely right. We've had more hearings on insurance issues and other issues and only one on housing, but it's not about public housing. It's not about Section 8. It's not about vouchers. It's not about homelessness. It's not about anything that we're talking about, and that's taking care of people. People are our greatest asset. I mean, we can have all the banks in the world and everything else that we do in financial services, but if we don't take care of our people, then that doesn't really help keep our economy going. So for me in Texas, and I think the chairwoman's already mentioned, Houston is, is doing a good job, but we got to keep going and make sure that we stay on track because our homeless uh, issue is still very, very uh, large. Uh, and we also have a shortage of housing, particularly start, first start housing, new workforce housing. The focus has been on development and going for the ones, the big homes, you know, you get more bang for the buck, you get higher taxes, but it's pushing out a lot of people. Uh, in Texas, the minimum wage is 7.25 cents an hour. So the average renter needs to be making 25.06, $25 to rent a two bedroom home. So they'd have to have almost three and a half jobs to be able to rent a home, and I've seen a lot of people with two jobs and three jobs, but there's not enough time in a day for three and a half. So while Texas is doing better, we're still lacking, especially since we are a border state. There still have issues related to access for Spanish language, uh, because the Spanish language barriers, just flat out discrimination, the old red lining still exists for many minority populations. And some of our programs, because of mixed status families, people are just not eligible for. There's this myth that immigrants are zapping our social services or taking money away from Americans. It's just a myth, y'all. It doesn't happen that way, and certainly not in Texas. So I'm pleased to be here with all these members supporting these bills because it really is what will help us not only in the short term by helping people, but in the long term in helping the economy. Thank you, and I yield now to Congressman Nickel. Hi, everyone. I'm Wiley Nickel. I represent North Carolina's 13th District. And uh, I have one of the fastest, if not the fastest growing congressional districts in the country. Housing is the top issue for the people that I represent in Congress. And under Maxine Waters' leadership, House Democrats are putting people over politics to bring down the cost of housing. And really glad to be here again with, with my fellow uh, members of the House Financial Services Committee. I serve on the Capital Markets Subcommittee, the Digital Assets Subcommittee, and the National Security Subcommittee. Right now, more than 343,000 households in North Carolina spend over half of their money, their monthly income on rent, leaving too little for other expenses like health care, transportation, 
and healthy food. Access to safe and affordable housing is essential to the well-being of working families in North Carolina and throughout the country. That's why Financial Services Committee Democrats are working to increase the supply of affordable housing and to lower the cost of living for working families. Financial Service Committee Democrats are fighting for initiatives like the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, the Home Investment Program, the Self-Help and Assisted Home Ownership Opportunity Program, the Public Housing Fund, Section 202 Housing, and Rental Assistance. We're also work, we're, we are also working to pass common sense legislation like Ranking Member Waters' Down Payment Toward Equity Act to help address racial wealth and home ownership gaps by providing $100 billion in direct assistance to help first-time, first-generation home buyers purchase their first home, getting their chance at the American dream. I'm going to continue to put forth common sense ideas and solutions to build more affordable housing, increase affordable housing access, and to tackle this housing crisis. Now I'd like to turn it over to my friend from the great state of Colorado, Congresswoman Brittany Pedersen. All right. I'm always at the end since I'm the freshman, so uh, you all are almost ready, uh, free to go. But great to see you all here. My name is Brittany Pedersen. I represent Colorado's 7th Congressional District, and I was in the legislature for 10 years representing the place that I grew up um, and now represent here in Congress. I can tell you that uh, coming to Congress and watching the urgent needs in my community and unfortunately the lack of priority here in the House majority has been very uh, frustrating to deal with. And one of those key issues and the reason why I asked to be on the Financial Services Committee and I'm on the Housing Subcommittee is the housing crisis. Um, this is an issue that I had not focused on before, but it is something that came up in every community that I went to as the number one issue that people were facing. My district is suburbs uh, as well as rural Colorado. We have resort communities and people who have lived in their, in their communities their entire life were getting pushed out as they've seen home values increase, sometimes up to fivefold in just a couple of years. Um, so we have hit the perfect storm of, we had uh, the recession and the housing crisis early on when I was in my early 20s. Uh, home builders were wiped out and we really reduced the amount of supply that was brought in. And then we have the uh, global pandemic and the economic fallout and consequences from that. And while we have the quickest and strongest recovery in the world, uh, unfortunately, people are still struggling to get by because of rising costs. One of the biggest rising costs has been housing. We have to increase supply. I'm so proud of what Democrats are doing every day to actually bring solutions on this, and it is incredibly frustrating to watch these bills sit on the sidelines instead of being prioritized, heard in committee, and passed on the House floor. I, I want to thank um, our ranking member Waters for the work and the leadership that you've brought for years. I am hopeful uh, that you will be our chair again soon and we can actually um, bring these bills. But in the meantime, we're still working on bipartisan legislation and what we can do to bring those private and public investments to increase supply and address the workforce shortage issue. You all know that one of the uh, biggest issues facing employers right now in every sector is the ability to hire the workforce needed. Uh, we have a broken immigration system. We have people begging to come here to work, and we don't create the opportunities to fill those voids. It's the number one thing we could do to address rising costs, and especially when it comes to the construction industry. And so I look forward to working alongside my colleagues to bring pragmatic solutions to address the housing crisis. This is something that intersects in every issue that we care about, and it is something um, that has affected my family personally. My dad uh, lost his house after going through the recession and found himself homeless for numerous years. My mom was uh, a Section 8 had Section 8 housing, and she's one of the lucky ones, and it saved her life. Um, and so I know firsthand how critical it is to have a roof over your head, and I have seen the consequences of failed policy and the lack of opportunity out there for so many people. So I appreciate you all for caring about this issue and to the members who stand here with me for your priority on this uh, critical issue for Colorado. Oh, sorry. And now I get to bring up who is next? Congresswoman Garcia. 
Ramirez. Ramirez. Ramirez already went. Or Garcia already went. Yes. Sorry. There we go. Hey. <laughs> Homeland Security. Ramirez, Ramirez, Ramirez. My name is Delia Ramirez. I am the Congresswoman of Illinois 3, and I represent the northwest side of the city of Chicago and the northwestern suburbs. Three years ago, I debated an emergency housing relief bill in the state legislature. It was right after the leadership of Chairwoman Maxine Waters that we were about to get emergency relief assistance and also moratorium on evictions and making sure that people are able to stay in their homes in the midst of the pandemic. As I debated that, I knew that if it weren't for the legislation at the federal level that had passed to provide so much financial assistance, that in the state of Illinois, we would see more than 100,000 people for the very first time experience homelessness. That funding and your leadership literally kept thousands of families in their homes at the most difficult and painful time that we had ever seen for many of us in our entire life. Today I get to serve in Congress and I get to see and work alongside so many of my colleagues who are here today making sure that we remind people that when we come here to work, we actually can bring solutions and create housing security. I look forward to seeing us get into the majority, but I also know that our ranking member doesn't wait until we get to the majority to get things done. <laughs> and she is creative and she is persistent and she makes sure that all of us understand that when it comes to housing, it interconnects with everything you and I care about. If it's healthcare, if it's education, if it's mental health, it's getting to the issues of why people are dealing with substance abuse. All of these things are interconnected. And so I'm really grateful for these pieces of legislation. I call all my colleagues to consider co-sponsoring it because here's the thing. Housing and security is not a democratic issue. It is an American issue. It impacts Democrats, Republicans, independents, children, and those that don't even know what they want to be in a party or if they want to be part of a party. And as I think about the average age of someone experiencing homelessness, what do you think that is? It's nine years of age. Our responsibility is to our children and to the future of this nation. This legislation will be transformative in ending homelessness making it easier for people to keep their apartments, preventing homelessness, and helping everyday people finally have that dream of their home. And we have legislation to make that happen. I can't thank Ranking Member Maxine Waters enough. We're going to get it done because this relentless leader here won't stop until we do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. I think that we have to uh, leave the room. We'll take a few questions. Yes, sir. out the way now she's worked with uh, uh, Brandon Johnson in Chicago is there a way for us to mirror that across the country uh, because where the members have relationships it seems like y'all work better with completing it because you don't have the fight I just I love the fact that she went right into LA and went to work because she was a member before uh, Brandon uh, had that conversation I was there in at the Black Caucus, and he went right back, and now he just last month announced that mm -hmm. the, the uh, bring Chicago uh, the, home. Yeah, mm -hmm. they eliminated all the, the things. And I know I used to live in Vegas, and we had a home problem. Thanks to see that you're out there. What can we do to make sure that the red tape is out of the way for even small builders and developers uh, in, in America? Well, first of all, thank you so very much uh, for mentioning Marsha Fudge. A uh, great uh, supporter of housing and working hard to get rid of homelessness. But she's doing it in a way that we are trying to get people focused on, working with the locals. Once we send this money uh, from the federal government, the locals get it, and we have to help them decide how to spend this money in ways that's going to get rid of the problem. There are many funding sources, whether we're talking about 
uh, CDBG, or we're talking about home, et cetera, et cetera. Now we've got to make sure that the mayors and the city councils who are making decisions about how that money gets spent are working closely with us uh, to carry out the mission uh, that we've all said that we support, and that is getting rid of homelessness, creating more housing opportunities, and opening up opportunities for our young people and our millennials and others who cannot afford 20% down to get down payment assistance. Fixing up, you know, our public housing that's in great disrepair in New York. The elevators are not working. Uh, the heat's not on, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, she's doing a good job, and that's the way to do it. I'm g somebody come help me get these. Uh, I, before I forget, yes, come right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a lot of millennials and Gen Z, you just mentioned, um, folks who read my work have given up on the American dream, have given up on the idea of going to home. And you mentioned a lot of legislation that you all are working on to push, but what's your message to folks out there who are uninspired, who don't believe that the American dream is attainable anymore, that don't believe that they'll ever be able to maybe inherit a home from a parent? Uh, you're absolutely correct, and I think we've all experienced that in um, engaging uh, with our young people, et cetera. But we have a president, and the vice president who was here said this is at the top of the agenda, which really does make us feel very good uh, that they are going to make this a priority. Secondly, we've got to look deeper into what creates homelessness. And we gotta deal with health problems, mental health. We've gotta deal with not in my backyard. We gotta deal with hedge funds and private equity who buy up a lot of places, raise the rent, and then do not put money back into repair, et cetera, et cetera. We gotta fix the systems rather than just talk about it. And we've got to call some people out. That includes, again, our banks, our hedge funds, private equity, and others who have too many friends in Congress. We're going to go right down this row and right to the second one. Okay, yes. Just two more. Oh, we can't. Okay. Thank you, Congressman. I just wanted to ask if you've had any conversations with Chairman Patrick McHenry about any of your plans, housing, and if he has any bipartisan support. Well, you know, Chairman McHenry is leaving, and um, we have a decent relationship. And, of course, I talk with him all the time uh, about housing. The Republicans are not interested necessarily in investing in housing. While I think he really does care, uh, they have the kind of operation that their decisions come from the top down. And, you know, Trump does not care about homelessness at all. He's talking about locking up people who are sleeping on the streets. So I don't have any real commitments, but I have the opportunity to talk with him and engage him as we take on this new approach to dealing with getting rid of what is wrong with the systems and the funding. So I'm optimistic. Yes, sir. Okay, if any, would you like to take I would this? Just say yeah. That, you know, under the chair, <laughs> under the chair's leadership, um, and working with the Congressional Black Caucus and, and others, we've identified executive <clears throat> actions that this administration has taken. I think it's important that we remind people where we've come from since this pandemic, and the fact that again, because of the investments that helped keep people in their homes you know, avoiding uh, eviction and uh, the amount of support that was provided to land to, to, to individuals to pay their rent so that they didn't get evicted. I'm experiencing that right now in North Las Vegas. We had those protections during those executive actions that the administration took, but they, they've been lifted by most of these governors, right, and local uh, governments. And that's why I think what the chairwoman is doing to really look deep into what's happening on the local level 
That's how we're going to fix the systemic issues. Yes, the administration can and will do more as we identify it, but there's a lot of things we can be doing right now if local government works with us to make these reforms and to streamline the process. Would you like to join me in one? Let me just get started with this. There are, like you said, 101 things uh, that get in the way of uh, producing affordable housing. Uh, and whether you're talking about, you know, what is happening at the local level, the other kinds of problems that cities and states have that they've got to deal with, let me suggest to you none are more important than housing. If you don't have a safe and secure place to live, you can't deal uh, with the problems of your family. You can't engage government. And so we believe that housing, affordable housing, decent housing is a right. And because we believe so deeply in it, not only we go going to do legislation, work with the administration and the president, and work on the locals so that we can get the price of building housing down. Just an example, when the locals negotiate with so-called affordable uh, housing developers, they can help decrease that cost or increase it. Sometimes the requirements to change the wiring in the neighborhood, to remove a, high fire, a, a, a fire hydrant, all of these things add to the cost. And so, in Los Angeles, right now, the cost of affordable units is $500,000 to produce. That's ridiculous. We got to get the prices down. We know some of that had to do with supply uh, because of COVID, et cetera, but that has changed significantly. We have other things that we need to do, as was said, systemic things that we can work on. Yes, we're going to get right down the line. They said we got to get out of here. One more. Oh, my goodness. I to ask, Stand up, please, so we can hear you. Not only are we concerned about it, uh, we're going to do something about it. Uh, it is very, very important that we let none of these issues get in the way of our determination uh, to get affordable, decent, secure housing for the people of this country. Many of you who are sitting in this room right now, not only do you see it in your daily lives as everybody else, it's affecting some of you. Some of you are doing well but not well enough to buy a house yet. Not well enough to live where you want to live because the rent is too high. And so, yes, there are going to be political problems, but we are politicians. And so politicians should know how to fight politically. And that's what we're going to do in addition to all the other things that we're doing. We're still trying to carry out Dodd-Frank 
They got rid of a predatory lending for the most part. Uh, but yes, we understand that we are confronted with a lot of difficult issues, but we are determined. That's why we're talking with you today. We want you to help carry this message. We want you to join us in this fight. I know you are confronted with a lot of other issues that you have to pay attention to, whether it's what's going on in the Red Sea or what's going on in Gaza, what's going on in, in, in the Middle East. But we want you to give this some attention, not only for the people uh, that we're so desperately trying to get off the street, but for you and your families to come, because a lot of you haven't started yet, but you will. Thank you very much. We have to go now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
uh, and our Republican counterparts routinely elevate xenophobic narratives publicly. Uh, a few ongoing issues in this sphere is we fought back against efforts to reinstate the Trump era Department of Justice China Initiative Program, which was an incredibly flawed and ineffective program that racially profiled Chinese scientists and researchers. We are pushing back against provisions that would restrict land ownership for Chinese immigrant communities across various states and in California. These xenophobic measures echo the alien land laws of the 19th and 20th centuries, stripping uh, Chinese, Japanese, and uh, Indian and Korean Americans of their property land ownership rights. Uh, Florida has passed a uh, law that in, would, in fact, prevent Chinese nationals from owning land, and uh, they um, are, in fact, uh, demanding that every Chinese national that owns a piece of property in Florida register their property, otherwise face a $1,000 a day fine. We find this outrageous. Um, and that's why uh, I recently joined my fellow KPAC member, Al Green, and I to introduce a federal law, which is the Preemption of Real Property Discrimination Act, prohibiting such state laws from taking effect. I also want to talk about our other initiatives. One is a um, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative. Uh, we are about to send a letter asking the Fortune 100 corporations about their efforts to promote AANHPIs in their corporations and uh, their efforts to help the community. We also uh, are addressing gun violence. And in fact, uh, it was just one year ago that there was a mass shooting in my hometown of Monterey Park uh, in which a shooter claimed the lives of 11 innocent people and injured nine others, all of whom were Asian American. <clears throat> no community should experience what Monterey Park had has experienced, but we've seen shooting after shooting, and uh, I am proud that KPAC has stood shoulder to shoulder with our Tricaucus counterparts to do all we can to protect our communities from deceptive gun lobby tactics targeting us um, and trying to actually get immigrant communities to buy more guns. That's why KPAC endorsed the assault weapons ban legislation just weeks after the Monterey Park shooting, and I have introduced the Language Access to Gun Violence Prevention Strategies Act to ensure that communities that otherwise would be ignored would actually know about the red flag laws uh, and that such strategies are done in language and in uh, culturally appropriate ways. And then there's Health Equity Act. Since 2007, the Tri Caucus has introduced the Health Equity and Accountability Act, or HEA, as a landmark bill to address health disparities amongst racial and ethnic minorities. This legislative blueprint includes measures tackling specific diseases that disproportionately impact our community. For example, though we represent 6% of the population in the United States, AANHPIs account for over half of the 1.4 million domestic chronic hepatitis B cases. And so every Congress, uh, the, uh, this bill is alternated between CHC, CBC, and us. And I'm thrilled that in this Congress, we are the ones at the helm of this very important bill. So we will not stop our fight against harmful narratives and provisions that will endanger Asian Americans. We will continue to address the scourge of gun violence, strengthen affirmative action and DEI policies that have unlocked so much opportunity and potential for our underserved communities. We will advocate for health equity and um, it will take all of KPAC and our allies in the Democratic Caucus working together to make real progress. And now I would like to in introduce KPAC's second vice chair, Congress member Mark Takano, to say a few words. Great. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Shu. And uh, although uh, Vice Chair Grace Meng is not here, I want to thank you both for your leadership. Uh, over the past year, uh, KPAC has been hard at work advocating for AAI, AAPI people across the country who face unique challenges. In particular, we have seen an alarming trend 
of legislation springing up across the country to restrict land and property ownership, uh, and not for any crime, but basically, basically, uh, it's based solely on uh, their nationality. Florida and Texas state legislatures are aiming to pass blanket prohibitions on individual citizens based on their foreign countries in the name of national security. These laws do not make us safer. They are misguided at best um, and outright racist at worst. This is not the first time our country has been here. If we look back on this nation's history, discriminatory land laws have been a regrettable legacy of sing singling out citizens who otherwise have no connection to the actions of their governments, um, the governments from which they have originated. Now, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, which prohibited Chinese people from becoming naturalized citizens. It should be pointed out that uh, there was a proscription of naturalization of Asian immigrants generally from the beginning of this republic. Um, and uh, toward the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, we saw uh, alien land laws passed in states like California, Washington State. Washington State is actually enshrined. It, it was enshrined in the Washington State Constitution. Uh, it made anyone who was ineligible for naturalization, it was ostensibly a neutrally worded uh, law. It was on, on its face neutral, but in fact, uh, the, the phrasing of these alien uh, land laws uh, singled out Asian immigrants, which includes all of the basic ethnicities you see up here. East Asians, South Asians, we were all included. Um, it, numerous states followed suit, and this law, these laws lasted uh, well into the 20th century. We saw what happened in World War II. Um, this was a precursor to these alien land laws were precursors to the Asian hate, which led to the incarceration of over 120,000 Japanese Americans. Now, let me tell you, I have my own personal story about how the alien land law affected uh, my own immigrant grandfather uh, and my American-born grandmother. Uh, my, uh, my grandfather was not able to buy property, and so I, can, I went back and checked the deed of the original land that they owned uh, in Bellevue, Washington. It was in the name of my American-born grandmother because my grandfather could not purchase that property. They would eventually lose that property during World War II because they couldn't make the taxes. And why couldn't they uh, pay the taxes on the property? They were interned, uh, and they couldn't operate the, um, the, the greenhouses uh, that they, uh, that they uh, had owned. Uh, I have in my home community the Harada House. The Harada House is, a, is the is the remaining house of the uh, the house that the Harada family donated to the city of Riverside. But when they when Jukichi Harada bought it, uh, in I think 1916, uh, there were challenges by the neighbors, who said that he was violating the alien land law, and that Jukichi Harada was uh, illegally getting around the law by purchasing the land in the name of the children. This was a case right in my own community in Riverside, California, and uh, the judge eventually did not throw out the alien land law, but he said Jukichi Harada could by it in the name of his children. I'm telling you, these were very real instances of uh, discriminatory laws aimed directly at Asian Americans, and we're seeing a resurgence and a return uh, to these laws based on, I believe, um, an insistence of the Republican Party to stir up and drum up fear um, about China, uh, and it's distorted and misguided, uh, and I think we need to uh, point this out, uh, and we need to call it out, and we need to say, uh, this is wrong. Thank you so much. And by the way, we're also so very proud that our uh, KPAC members are leaders in uh, the whole caucus. Uh, Congress member Mark Takano is the ranking member, soon to be chair, of the Veterans Committee. And we have Ted Liu, who's the vice chair of the whole Democratic caucus. And uh, that means, well, actually, he's the first Asian American to be elected to leadership. We're so proud of him. And we're so happy that he is also KPAC's whip. So Congress Member Ted Liu. Thank you, Chairwoman Chu. And let me first uh, thank Chairwoman Chu for her leadership. Uh, under her leadership, we have the highest number of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders in Congress in U.S. history. 
When it comes to the Asian American community, I have good news and bad news. So I'm going to start with the bad news first. There has been a shocking rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans. And during the pandemic, hate crimes increased by over 330 percent. And one of the reasons is because our former president blamed people that look like me for the COVID-19 pandemic. He used racist phrases like Kung flu. Uh, he made it seem like uh, Asians were the reason for why the virus was in the United States. And then he also went ahead and mocked Asian Americans. He mocked his own secretary, Elaine Chow. He mocked her last name. He continues to do so. Uh, that is one reason he lost the election. He disrespected the Asian American community, and he continues to do so. Now, good news is, thank goodness, Joe Biden is exactly the opposite. Joe Biden signed two executive orders to combat AAPI hate. Joe Biden signed the bicameral bipartisan legislation that Judy Chu and Grace Meng and others here push for to combat COVID-19 hate crimes. In addition, we know from the U.S. Census that Asian Americans are the fastest rising ethnic group in America, doubling in size in just the last 20 years. Asian Americans are now enough to swing presidential swing states and elections such as the election that's coming up uh, next week for the district held by the person purportedly known as George Santos. And Asian Americans in that race, if they vote, uh, can swing the victory either direction. And so now you have both parties targeting Asian Americans. That is a good thing for the community. But at the end of the day, there's only one party that respects Asian Americans. It's a Democratic Party because we don't make fun of people's last names or people that look like Asian Americans. And so with that, I'm going to turn it back to our great chairwoman, Judy Chu. Well, we are also very proud of this leader. Uh, Bobby Scott is the ranking member of a very important committee, the Education and Labor Committee. I, I think they have another name, but I always call it Education and Labor. And, um, <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, he is uh, another, he's one out of two uh, AAPI committee chairs and um, or ranking members. And so thank you, Bobby, for being here. Let me turn the podium over to Bobby Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Judy, and thank you for your leadership on, on KPAC. You've done a tremendous job uh, growing and focusing us on the issues. I'm not going to be competitive. I'm going to talk um, uh, the um, uh Chair of the um, Civil Rights and Voting Rights Task Force, I'll focus my remarks just on that uh, that issue. The right to vote is a cornerstone of, cornerstone of our democracy, yet there's been a decades-long campaign and some, um, by some in our country to roll back the ballot box, both in state legislatures and on the federal level. The Asian, Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander community are no strangers to the need uh, for voting protections. Uh, we've already heard of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which prevented Chinese Americans from um, uh, being naturalized citizens and obviously in, meant that they could not vote. In certain states, there's been a criminalization of individuals and groups assisting in voter registration and the withdrawal and denial of multilingual ballots and translation at the polls. These attacks, along with other suppressive actions, such as aggressive gerrymandering, restrictive voter ID laws, polling location closures, restrictions on early voting, all weaken our democracy. The, uh, ten years ago, the uh, Supreme Court in Shelby v. Holder uh, is still being felt, the, the problems with that are still being felt in several redistricting cases, Alabama, Louisiana, Florida, and maybe others, We've seen uh, changes being made. Well, in the meanwhile, during the litigation, people have been sitting in those seats that should have been occupied by others if the redistricting has been, been done right. And if there had been preclearance that was overturned in Shelby, they never would have been able to uh, have those elections until the districts were done right. I think in this election there will be several people um, changes in those delegations that should have taken place two years ago, and there are probably enough seats in that category to have swung the majority of the House of Representatives. 
So the um, uh, value of uh, preclearance is still being fe felt on the congressional level, and who knows what the damage has been done on the city, county, and state legislative uh, uh, levels across the across the country. Uh, illegal gerrymander li limits the gerrymandering limits the electoral participation of voters, and I'm proud to join my Congressional Voting Rights Caucus co-chairs, Ter uh, Terry Sewell, in introducing the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, which would restore the preclearance provision and uh, make it so that uh, the illegal uh, voting changes would be stopped before they were even started because of preclearance. We're proud to pass that legislation when Democrats were in the majority and look forward to passing it again when we get the majority back. Congress must do its job to pass critical legislation to protect the Americans' right to vote, regardless of race or neighborhood, and have access to the polls and can exercise their fundamental right to vote. And I look forward to working with my KPAC colleagues, as well as the rest of the Democratic caucus, to getting that job done. Thank you, and I yield back to the gentlelady from California. And now I'd like to introduce a very outstanding member of Congress who uh, represents the Silicon Valley in California, uh, and not only uh, is heard on the local level, but actually on the national level. And so, Congress Member Ro Khanna. Well, thank you, uh, Judy Chu, for your exceptional leadership, and Grace Meng. Uh, I will be brief because we've had people like Ted Liu, who's our vice chair, and Bobby Scott and Mark Takano, our ranking members, already speak, so I don't have uh, a lot to add. Uh, I will just make two points. One, to underscore what Ted Liu said, the Asian American vote will be decisive in 2024. It will be decisive uh, in obvious states like Nevada, but it also will be decisive in states like Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan, uh, Georgia, uh, and uh, I believe it, the, the story wasn't covered enough of how much the Asian American vote came out in places like Pennsylvania and Georgia uh, for us to win in uh, 2020. Uh, and this is going to be a huge source of strength, in my view, uh, for the president to win re-election in those battleground states. Uh, and I know all of us are going to be working uh, to mobilize that community and really respect that community and understand its uh, electoral significance. Uh, the second point I'll make is... Uh, in my view, there, there are two things that are uh, paramount to the Asian American community. One is we need more people in this country speaking about the uh, positives of immigration. Every time uh, we hear immigration, people automatically think about the border. But the reality is immigrants have contributed so much to the success of America, the entrepreneurship, the small businesses, the technology companies, uh, the work in uh, hospitality, on farms, in uh, it, it, driving taxi cabs and Ubers. I mean, it, and we need to celebrate uh, the immigrant story in America again. Uh, and second, that the Asian American community is one of the most aspirational communities in terms of the American dream. And a lot of the president's policies and the House Democratic Caucus's policies that have helped uh, create new jobs, that have helped uh, small businesses get financing, that have helped people with their student loans are things that are appealing to that community. So uh, I appreciate Judy Chu's exceptional leadership and looking forward to working with KPAC for Biden to win in uh, 2024. And now, one of KPAC's newest executive members. Yes, he was the first Asian American to be elected in Michigan. And that is our Congress member, Sri Thanadar. Thank you, Congresswoman Judy Chu, and thank you for your leadership. Uh, I represent uh, Michigan's 13th Congressional District, which is Detroit, Michigan. Uh, my state and my city is critical in the presidential election uh, in this swing state. Uh, I uh, am an immigrant. Uh, I was 24 years old in India, growing up in poverty, and uh, got admission into a PhD program here in chemistry. And uh, I, my student visa was denied by the American Embassy four times before I finally got my visa so I could come here. Came to United States with $20 in my pocket, got my education, started a small business that created over 500 jobs, and now has an opportunity to represent 750 Americans in uh, the United States Congress. 
one of the focus is the immigration. Our immigration system is broken, uh, especially uh, the focus often has been by the other party on the southern border. Often it gets forgotten the contribution immigrants have made to our great economy. Uh, you know, when I talk to tech industry, uh, they're always looking for skilled uh, labor force, engineers, doc you know, doctors, and uh, people that are skilled in. And uh, because of our broken immigration policy, because of our H-1B visas, because it is such a hard thing to get a green cards and the struggles and the stress uh, engineers and skilled uh, workers have, uh, many of our uh, skilled workers are now leaving uh, Canada has attracted many of our skilled workers. Uh, Australia is attracting our skilled workers and that's depriving uh, American businesses of productivity uh, for getting us ahead in innovation. So um, I'm just glad to be in Congress. I'm glad to be here uh, to, uh, you know, uh, work on the uh, our broken immigration system and it's more than uh, just what's happening on the southern border. Thank you. Well, thank you. We have time for a few questions. Uh, yes. I want to ask about um, Senator Tom Cotton's questionnaire for TikTok CEO, whether you saw it um, as part of the reaction to the Trump administration. I have strong feelings about it. Uh, Senator Tom Cotton basically harassed the TikTok uh, CEO by asking him whether he was a member of the Chinese Communist Party. And then the CEO said, I'm Singaporean. And <laughs> then Tom Cotton continued to ask him whether he was a member of the CCP. And uh, I don't know if Senator Cotton realizes that if you're a Singaporean, you don't exactly sign up to be a member of the Chinese Communist Party. It is impossible. But he continued to do that. I thought it was outrageous and showed such incredible ignorance. Uh, there are different countries in Asia, and not everybody who has an Asian face is a member of the Chinese Communist Party. So it's very stereotypical and racist. And any others? I just want to say, um, I'm also thinking of, on, along the theme of Senator. Senator Cotton, to me, typifies um, a, a universal Republican effort to focus and demonize China. And not to say that China does not present us with some national security challenges. But you know what? Russia presents us with national security challenges. We don't see Florida's governor or Texas's governor uh, putting uh, Russian nationals to the same paces that they're putting uh, Chinese nationals under. That's why I'm saying, so it's our suspicion, my suspicion, that Senator Tom Cotton typifies a spring-loaded, uh, biased, uh, concerted effort uh, to focus on, on Chinese and those who look like they're Chinese. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I know that there are a lot of concerns um, before the uh, China select the, the select committee on China was um, presented. I want to ask what you think of the work this committee has done so far. I mean, did some of your concerns come to fruition in terms of demonizing China, just like what uh, Congressman Connor just said? Or um, I just want to get your thoughts on. It. I know it's one of the few bipartisan committees that. Uh, our ranking member, Raja Krishnamurthy, has done a fantastic job on that committee, as well as all the other members uh, on that committee. I know uh, Congressman Khanna has done a fantastic job as well. And when you look at this issue, there's a lot of complexities, a lot of nuances. It's important that uh, we get things right, because if we don't get things right, it's going to affect both countries negatively, and it's going to affect the populations in both countries. When that committee started off, they literally started off with uh, very sort of hostile remarks. Now I think they're much more focused on, okay, what policies can we actually work on uh, that are going to help U.S. national security and allow uh, U.S. businesses to continue to thrive and allow investments to come into the United States and vice versa. So I think that is a proper path uh, to take. Chinese artificial intelligence companies and semiconductor 
companies that then were helping the uh, Chinese government and military in different ways. Do you have any comments on the report? Well, let me just say two things. First, I think this is an example of CAPEX uh, effectiveness, because uh, if it weren't for uh, Judy Chu and KPEC and Ted Liu's leadership, the China Select Committee would look very different. Uh, it would have been one uh, that could have veered down the line of McCarthyism in a modern form. And in the beginning, uh, there were concerns of some of the comments that were coming out of uh, 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 colleagues on the other side. And KPEC stood very, very firm. I think that had an influence on our leadership. It had an influence on uh, Representative Krishnamurthy, and that's why uh, the committee is in the form it is. And so this is a very concrete example of KPEC's leadership. On the report itself, I mean, uh, obviously we don't want uh, venture capital uh, dollars going to uh, the Chinese Communist Party's uh, investments in military uh, equipment or uh, advanced AI that can affect, impact the military. My understanding is that uh, the firm uh, involved uh, has separated uh, and now has a, a, a distinct uh, uh, entity in China and a distinct entity here uh, to address that issue. Before the report came out? My understanding is that they've done it before the report. All five? I don't know all five. I know one of them has. Okay. okay one last question. If not, then thank you all very much. We really appreciate you being here.
my tools. Here, let's uh, mix it up, yeah, male and female. <laughs> <laughs> Balance it out. Uh, all right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much to the new New Dems. I'm Annie Custer, uh, chair of the New Democrat Coalition. I represent New Hampshire's second district. And we are super excited to be here today with all of you to talk about the work that New Dems are doing on the Hill to deliver for hardworking American families and to talk about our plan to win back the House and the work that we're doing on the campaign trail for November 2024. So just a preview, in 2022, New Dems held off the big red wave. Uh, we protected 22 incumbent members of New Dems, and we welcomed 18 new members of Congress, including flipping five seats from red to blue. Even with a slim majority, uh, we have worked across the aisle to deliver for the American people. We're in the slim minority, but that's why we have been so crucial in our role as moderate, pragmatic, can-do caucus. Our members have played a key role. Uh, if you go back to um, Memorial Day weekend, on the debt ceiling crisis, on the three different times that the government faced a shutdown, on the more recent bipartisan tax deal, and hopefully uh, with the good news coming out of the Senate today, we will be the ones that will put up the votes to pass the supplemental aid. Every time new Dems have been there, to work across the aisle with our colleagues and to get the job done. We have 10 task forces that are very busy developing and advancing policies on everything from health care to housing, immigration reform, and our biggest and newest on AI. While our mission is always working together, this far-right Republican House has made bipartisanship harder than ever before. And while Republicans continue to fail to pass any meaningful legislation without Democrats, new Dems have been busy laying the groundwork for when we take back the majority in November. So part of what we do is work on trying to get things done now, and part of what we do is planning for the future when we do take back the House. And that's why our members are working literally tirelessly to recruit and support candidates across the country that will be running in these tough seats and ultimately flipping seats from red to blue. So far, we've endorsed 15 candidates, many of them in red to blue races, and we plan to keep that momentum going with a new announcement as early as next week. This will be one of the most important elections of our lifetime, and it's critical that we get the word out about the work that our members and our new Dem candidates are doing to bring down costs, to protect our freedoms, and to make Americans' lives better. If anyone can get the work done in the House and take back the majority, we're proud to say it's the Can Do Caucus. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark Vesey from Texas, our New Dem National Finance Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Mark Vesey, the uh, chair of our uh, New Dem Action Fund National Finance Team, and it's good to see all y'all. Uh, I wanted to discuss the work that we're doing to get the resources uh, to our candidates. But first, I'd, likely, I'd like to first call attention to the dysfunction and chaos uh, that is obviously plaguing this Republican-led controlled uh, house. Uh, as you know, this week, uh, reckless radical Republicans launched a sham impeachment that literally went down in flames and also sunk attempts at a bipartisan border deal, making it even more clear that they will do anything just to get Donald Trump reelected. Uh, and yesterday, the Affordable Con Connectivity Program, uh, that's a program uh, that is very important to this entire coalition of new Dems. Uh, and uh, it stopped receiving new enrollments uh, so they can use the remaining uh, funding uh, for those already enrolled. And despite the ACP's impact, literally 23 million households across our country, including Households in millions of rural Republican districts, mm -hmm. unfortunately, are, are going uh, to not be met because these do-nothing Republicans have blocked 
uh, any consideration of the funding it needs uh, to keep this program uh, running uh, and is pushing us towards the program's expiration in April. Uh, but I will tell you this, that New Dems remain steadfast in their commitment to this important program and working to deliver common sense solutions uh, to all the challenges that American families face. Uh, these are just a few reasons why it's absolutely essential uh, that Democrats take back the House, and that's why New Dems are doing everything in our power to ensure that the members and candidates have the resources they need uh, to run in what's going to be a very competitive cycle uh, this year, 2024. And as finance chair, uh, Annie and myself and other members of the New Dam, we're traveling around the country. Uh, we're communicating our message in cities and towns, in urban areas, in rural areas, and making sure that people know what we're all about. And I can tell you that as a result uh, of the chairwoman's uh, hard work and, and every member uh, that you see standing here today, uh, New Dem's Action Fund efforts have raised over $5 million for our PAC members and the DCCC. And just last week, uh, at our annual fundraiser for the DTRIP, the Action Fund raised over $1 million uh, for the DCCC. And so that means that the New Dem Action Fund is on path to raise more than $10 million for the 2024 cycle, including $2.4 million uh, for the DCCC. That's more money than our operations have raised in any previous cycle. So I look forward to using my position and working with my colleagues in this coalition to flip back the House to Dems with members who are ready to roll up their sleeves and get things done. Thank you. Yep. Next is Nikki Bozinski. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark, uh, and good afternoon. Um, I'm Nikki Bozinski. I represent the 13th district. I'm going to see if I can get this. There we go. I represent the 13th district in the state of Illinois, and I'm just thrilled to be here working with the New Dems to make Congress work for working people. Um, in 2002, I flipped a seat from red to blue in my home state, thanks in large part to the New Dems. And I want to thank some of my other freshman colleagues that are with us here today, too, um, that are also members of the New Dem Coalition. I currently serve as the freshman leadership representative for the coalition and support our New Dem leadership team. The New Dem Coalition has been very a very important um, community for all of us on Capitol Hill. Since joining the House, New Dems has helped us to get settled and set up, has supported our committee requests and work, and has been an important space for us to engage in serious political work that matters most to our constituents back home. From the policy task force meetings to New Dem lunches with administration officials, CEOs, and other key leaders, we've learned so much through uh, the New Dems and look forward to welcoming a new class uh, next year to Congress. As many of us gear up for very tough races this year, we'll be working with New Dems to ensure we can keep battleground seats blue and flip seats to bring more New Dems to Congress and ultimately make the majority as we often refer to ourselves as the majority makers. And now I'm very excited to turn it over to Greg Stanton to talk about uh, the work he's been doing on immigration and border security. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman, uh, uh, very much. Uh, I'm Greg Stanton. I represent Arizona District 4 before coming to Congress. I was mayor of the city of Phoenix, so I've been involved in border issues for a long period of time. What happened this week in the United States Senate uh, with regard to the border agreement deal is disappointing and it is disgraceful. It's the very worst of politics and it's why the American people are so cynical about what happens in Washington. The New Dems stood ready to support the plan that came out of the Senate. It did not have all of our priorities. It left out protection for dreamers. It didn't do much to expand legal pathways to build the workforce that we need, but it was the right thing to do to reestablish order at the southern border. But Republican leadership before the ink was dry, before any of us even had a chance to read it, said the bill would never get a vote in the House of Representatives. Quote, it was dead on arrival, said our speaker. Look, I'm hopeful that we will find a path forward on the narrow national security supplemental to get aid to our uh, allies. That seems like the direction that we are headed in. But we can't give up on immigration reform 
And we are not giving up because the new Democrats are the can-do caucus. I'm fortunate to chair the New Dems Immigration and Border Security Task Force, and our members have been working hard to find solutions. We've met with members across the aisle and with the Senate to find places of agreement. In the coming weeks, we'll be releasing our Immigration and Border Security Framework, a starting point for continued bipartisan talks. We have to secure the border. There's no disagreement there. But New Dems believe we can do bo stronger border security and immigration reform that grows the American economy. There's an incredible opportunity to hear. We've added 7.5 million jobs over the last two years. We've made historic investments in advanced manufacturing, infrastructure, green energy, but we don't have the workforce to fill those jobs. It is a waste. We know the American people are with us on this most important issue, but we need the business community to get off the sidelines and start backing the efforts that we are working on with the new Dems. And now we'll turn it over. I guess he's not here. So I'll turn it back over to our chair, our leader, Annie Custer for Q&A. Great. Great. Thank you so much. And that study that he was just citing is a brand new uh, CBO study that we commend to all of you about the impact of foreign-born workers with legal immigration on our economy. It's truly stunning. And New Dems is going to start to shift the discussion around, yes, absolutely, border security, legal pathways to immigration, but really focusing in on workforce. We, I can say from New Hampshire, we have a 2% unemployment rate. And we need workers to do the jobs of all the incredible things that we passed last cycle about the jobs and infrastructure bill, about the chips bill, mm -hmm. about broadband across this country. And um, so stay tuned. You'll be hearing more from us on that. And Greg, thank you for your leadership. Um, we also have great members with us, Brittany P Patterson. Uh, let's see, Jennifer McClellan, um, Greg uh, Lansman, thank you. <laughs> you should never do this under pressure, sorry. And Hillary scolded. I'm sorry. Greg is a superstar, and you've seen him on TV a lot. So we're very proud of our team. All right. Um, happy to open it up to questions. Yeah, lots of them. Okay, Max, go right ahead. Uh, just if you would say your name and your outlet. Sure. Yes. It seems at this moment in time, given the makeup of the House, Democrats can feel good about their chances of taking over. Yes. Europe. What do you think is the biggest factor working against that uh, prospect? Well, you know, it was interesting. We saw some very compelling uh, data that we still have work to do to get the good news out. And I think what I love about all these folks is they're very engaged at home in their districts. And so we need storytelling um, from our constituency. We need to show people the roads and bridges and highways. Mm -hmm. um, Greg's got a great story if you want to tell it real quick about your bridge. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah somebody did, uh, asked you know, if the, the president would be in the district. Uh, and uh, I reminded them that the president came to the district uh, at the beginning of the year and announced a $2.6 billion investment in our bridge. It's one of the most significant if not the most significant investments in the entire uh, infrastructure, bipartisan infrastructure uh, package. Uh, so I, I agree with Annie that it is, it is, it, it's those stories and getting folks to, to the polls. I mean, turnout's gonna be everything. Yeah, and there'll be more stories. We had a great lunch this week with Javier Becerra, Secretary of HHS, and he walked us through the prescription drug reform those negotiations are starting now. They'll be finishing in August. And so we'll have a great story to tell in the fall about lowering the cost of prescription drugs. Yeah, go ahead, Andrew. Uh, I wanted to ask about um, every member's favorite topic to be asked about Israel. Yes. Um, we saw, obviously, this week, you know, it's a difficult issue um, for Democrats to vote on. Um, I'm curious, going into the election, how you see, you know, New Dems especially navigating these sort of increasingly disparate coalitions where you have <coughs> some voters, progressives, and Arab voters on the one hand, really critical of the administration's support for Israel, and moderate swing district voters, Jewish voters as well. 
um, you know, still steadfastly supportive. Um, you know, how should members be be navigating that that difficult dynamic going into the election? Well, you make a good point, and this week. All politics is local, and members should vote their district. They should vote their constituency. What's complex about this issue is that our constituency also has various points of view. Um, I think what you'll find, that's why New Dems just put out this statement already today, to strong support for the big supplemental package. For aid to Israel, absolutely, first and foremost but also Ukraine, don't leave Ukraine behind, and also the uh, supplemental assistance humanitarian aid to the civilians in Gaza. That's critically important in all of our districts. The other thing is supporting the president. I had a uh, really fascinating meeting with the president. I'm excited the president's coming here today to talk to all of our members. And we talked about all of the steps that they are taking. Tony Blinken, literally round the clock. Uh, Jake Sullivan, round the clock to come up with a solution that will bring this war to a close, stop the killing. We can all agree on that. And then rebuild two-state solution, keep everybody safe. And I think we'll stay focused on that. There's not a big division within our caucus on that outcome. I think there's impatience to get there sooner, and we just need to be honest with our constituency. It's a complex process. It's a complex part of the world. Um, Brad, we're right in the middle of a question on Israel, if you wanted to comment. <laughs> what was the question? Take, take some bows and arrows. We're going to manage no, the division within our party on Israel. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about why I'm late. Um, we were just having a, a off-the-record conversation, but uh, you know, we, we have to be able to create safe places to have difficult conversations and, and hear each other. Um, I was asked uh, in an interview earlier, I was asked, uh, why is it so hard for people to come to the complexities of the issues? And the challenge is, the answer is, it's complex issues. This is really difficult. Uh, more. And... And the, and the bottom line is, Israelis and, and Palestinians, Jews and Arabs, both belong to the, the same land. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question has been for now several generations, how can two people share a common land? Uh, the answer is they can't until they recognize the legitimacy of each other. Mm -hmm. And so if I bring it to the caucus, coming late to the conversation, but I bring it to the caucus, we have to be able to see that there are, as I said earlier, there are facts. There are two sides that, or multiple sides. You can interpret facts in, in different, same facts in different ways. We have to be able to talk to each other. And then there are folks who are denying fact, the facts on both sides. And we have to be able to stand up to the deniers and say, no, you are wrong, without denying the legitimacy of people who can see the same thing uh, from different ways. Uh, the, the difference between interpretation and narrative, I guess, is the way to describe that. T to the extent that we can talk with each other and have conversations and hear each other, the way I've always said it is, I don't have to prove you wrong to be confident of what I know, but I'm not certain of what I know not to hear what you have to say and, and learn and maybe shift, and, and that's what we have to get to. I think that's a process that's happening in our caucus. Uh, it's a hard, slow process, but we'll get there. And what unites us, and I said this you know, actually just a few moments ago, what's, what unites every Democrat, specifically on this issue, is everyone in the Democratic caucus wants to see a de-escalation of the violence in Gaza, wants to see the hostages returned without conditions, but immediately. Everyone in our caucus wants to uh, get to a place where we can have a ceasefire. Now, this is me talking, a ceasefire, the gate to which is the release of the hostages, ultimately. But then a, a, that from that conditional ceasefire to an extended ceasefire, that's not the end goal, but an end goal of peace, two people living side by side, the Jewish state of Israel, uh, with safety and security in a Palestinian state in a broader region, lifting everyone up. Because as Democrats, we see the humanity of all people, and we... As Democrats, whether it's here at home, saying everyone should be able to have aspirations for their children that have the potentiality to be achieved, 
and that's true in the rest of the country. And I think that's where we uh, keep the, the caucus together. Well said. Thank you. All right. Uh, you want to go? And just uh, if you could say your name and your outlet again. For Casey Wooden with National Journal. Thanks, Casey. The economy, you know, we've seen good numbers come out, good job numbers. Uh, inflation is heading down. Uh, you know, we've seen the stock market do well. Polling shows that, you know, a lot of voters don't feel it. So how do you suggest, you know, New Dems and the White House better communicate that to voters? What's the plan to sort of tell them, to show them that you know, some of Biden's policies are, in fact, in fact having an improvement on the economy? And we were literally just talking about what are some nuts and bolts things that we can be doing back home in our districts. One is talking about prices. Some prices are still high. They haven't come down. Other prices have come down. Gas in my district, $2.99. Remind people that that's happening and connect the dots on the policy that helped to make that happen. Um, we talked about the price of insulin for Medicare recipients, $35. The price for prescription drugs capped at $2,000 per year. But we've got to keep hammering that home. <clears throat> and I think telling those stories from a very local perspective, put families up to tell the stories, hold roundtables. And there are still costs that are not coming down. Two in particular that we're very focused on, housing and childcare, because mm -hmm. they both really impact the workforce. Um, again, we talked about in parts of the country very, very low unemployment, but we can't bring workers in if we don't have housing for them. And we, even if we have housing for them, if, we can't, if they can't afford childcare in certain parts of the country, then they can't take the job. So we're trying to connect the dots on that with our policy task forces and then go home and tell the stories at home. Sure. Uh, go ahead, Michael. What's your outlet? Uh, once upon a hill. I talked to a lot of uh, young voters, a lot of uh, voters of color who talk about all of the crises and the system. A lot of them are institutional, and a lot of them are frustrated with what they view as incrementalism. New Dems pride themselves on common uh, working stuff on common ground, and sometimes that means that progress is a little slow. Can you speak to those voters out there about kind of uh, the legislative process for those who may not understand that sometimes? things happen in fits and starts, and you've got to keep going. For those voters out there who feel as though change isn't happening quick enough, what's your message to those voters as we get closer to the election? I would say we brought extraordinary change. And just going back to the Affordable Care Act, I think we're up to 22 million Americans have health insurance that never had health insurance before. And yet you do it step by step, piece by piece. Um, you know, look at the um, infrastructure bill and putting that kind of funding into our districts. Look at the chips bringing manufacturing back home. Those are jobs in my district, in Hudson, New Hampshire, a company called OnSemi that's going to be making microchips right here at home. So I think we have to point to really specific details and connect them to the policy. Um, I, I hear you, but on the other side, total chaos, total mm -hmm. confusion, no progress. And, you know, we need to talk that up. We need to call them out. When they say the quiet part out loud, I think Greg just referred to us, they said the quiet part out loud. They did not want the solution that they asked for that was negotiated for four months about the border because they want to run on the crisis at the border. We have to call people out for that. This has been the most dysfunctional Congress. I've been here 12 years. We have gotten nothing done that Dems didn't put the votes up to get done. And I think we have to draw that contrast and really show them, here's what serious dysfunction looks like. Trust me, nothing gets done. We're headed into the budget right now. I don't know, just saying. I don't know how they're going to get there. Like yeah, yeah, please. I mentioned it in my remarks a little bit earlier. Yeah. And I wanted to just mention this too, like something that is of substance from people from neighborhoods like that I grew up in in Fort Worth can understand. I talked about it in my opening remarks. We lowered people's internet bills, their broadband bills by $25, $30 a month. That's 23 million Americans. Think about that. I think about when I was a kid, how much that would have helped my mom. 
in the apartment complex that we lived in, the people that lived in Como that were the neighborhood that my mom was from, that if we had had something like that, that would have given people hope. We didn't have the internet back then. Let's make that clear. But I'm just saying, if we had had something like that to be able to help us, oh, it would have been, <laughs> it would have, it, it would have been something that's substantive, and that's something that we can go back and talk to people about. And I know lots of people in my district that have benefited from that extra money, and it's helped them with their bottom line at the end of the month. Yeah. Right, Jennifer, go ahead and jump okay. in, and then we'll have Brittany. And I think it's important to remember that the impact of over 300 years of slavery and Jim Crow is not going to be wiped out overnight. But the proof that we have made generational progress under this administration it is in the backlash that we are facing. The fact that we spent 14 hours on a debate on the National Defense Authorization Act over whether our service members should have two hours of diversity, equity, and inclusion training shows we are making progress. And, uh, and part of it is on us. One of the challenges we have this cycle that is greater than ever before is the proliferation of where people get their information. And we have to do a better job, and we're working on doing a better job, of meeting our voters in every community where they are, using the source of media that they use. And, and we're working on doing that better. But again, the backlash that we are facing proves that we are making progress. Otherwise, they wouldn't be fighting so hard to keep us from teaching a complete, honest, accurate history. Because they know if we teach our history and we show people where we're coming from and how far we have come in a short amount of time, if people know that history, then they, they will want us to go faster. And that's why we're facing this backlash right now from the Republican Party. Thanks for the question. Uh, as a, an 18-year-old who was very apathetic, I didn't show up and vote for my first election. I wasn't raised talking about politics I, or voting. And I thought that, you know, my voice didn't matter. And I saw the consequences in the 2000 election and how close Florida was. And I thought about how many people like me give up their power. And so we have to show up every single election and vote for the people that are going to fight for our shared values. That is the minimum that we can do. We can't expect uh, our change to progress if we're not willing to show up and do the very bare minimum, which is voting in every single election. And I'll just say real quickly, from the as Brad comes over, from the New Hampshire results, people turned out. They, we, they had to write in the president's name. And people turned out we had incredibly high, strong turnout. So when it becomes a, a you know, binary issue between chaos and confusion versus let's get the job done, that they're with us. Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. I think Chair Custer was exactly right. And I'm the last one to lecture young people on how they should vote. I'm way too old. But you talked about uh, progress and how we make progress. I think this is where the new dumb stand out. Uh, I have a saying that uh, moderate is a style, not a position. Right? I want to see the change we're all fighting for. I want to see the progress made. And Jennifer, I loved what you said um, about the pushback. Progress is never downhill. It's always uphill. Mm -hmm. And it is a hard push, and there are going to be people trying to pull us down and people trying to push us down, and we got to work to get there. Mm -hmm. Politics is the art of the possible, mm -hmm. and that's what the New Dems are all about. We're looking for where we can make progress step by step. And sometimes, and it's Super Bowl week, so I'll, I'll, I'll use my metaphors. Sometimes it's a, a, a hard grind slog. You're just trying to push forward for a couple of yards. And sometimes you have a chance to throw the long pass and, and make a, a big gain. And we're looking, and new Dems have always been the ones who are looking for those opportunities. And if you think about the successes we had with the American Rescue Plan, New Dems were at the forefront uh, with uh, many of the pieces of that legislation. Chips and Science Act, Infrastructure Bill, uh, Inflation Reduction Act. It's New Dems who are saying, what can we get? We aren't going to very often get everything we want, if ever, but we look for that compromise. And the best way for us to continue to make the progress and build on successes, whether they're successes that are long fought over 300 years or the recent successes that we've made, like equality, uh, marriage equality, the way we do that is electing folks like the people I'm standing with and ensuring that the vision we have for the future is reinforced with people committed to making sure that vision stays a reality. Great. Okay, one last question. Go right ahead. The shot news. Um, 
Good to see a new uh, black caucus member, but I, I, I'm curious to know, with Pam Q, the state president of the Board of Education running for Congress in Michigan, Theo Hopper, uh, actor, uh, classmate of Barack Obama, uh, saying publicly that they ha are not getting support from the Dems. Uh, I am ecstatic to see the white women up here, because you know, it used to be all white men. <laughs> I'm ecstatic to see all these, the, y'all make room better. Uh, but the real issue is the people of color, uh, as our, my colleague down the, 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 the row said, are not seeing the support for black candidates like we see for white candidates. And I'm glad Mark is over the money now. Maybe he can channel it a different way because uh, we know we trust him. What do we do, not to talk about the voters, but the people that reach the voters yeah. are the ones who are going to have more impact over us than the people who are in office. And I don't know how you feel uh, to our, our newest member. I'd like to hear your response. I'd definitely like to hear you know, yours and Mark's about what are we going to do to make sure that candidates that are good candidates are not told because they're black that they're ineligible when we got more white men losing. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And one of my number one priorities when I took over the chair was to emphasize the diversity of new Dems. So we have a dozen members of the CBC are new Dems, a dozen members of the CHC are new Dems. We have more and more um, HRC members are new Dems. We are recruiting and endorsing uh, people of color, women, uh, gay, lesbian, trans. We're about to have our first trans. Um, recruit. So, uh, look, the country is very diverse, and we want to be speaking to voters everywhere. And by the way, they're the best candidates right here. <laughs> Talk to the woman who won in Virginia. Yeah. I mean, they know how to get this done. So, I'm going to let Mark and okay. Jennifer go right ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say, you know, like back in the, especially in the 80s, 90s, I'll even say early 2000s there was always talk about, well, this person best fits the district. And so, you know, we need a black candidate for that district. We need a Hispanic candidate for that district. Uh, but what you're seeing, um, and I'll give a perfect example in my own backyard, Colin Aldrich. Colin Aldrich is a member of New Dam. He's now running for U.S. Senate. Uh, but when he got elected in 2018, he won in a district that included Highland Park and University Park, mm -hmm. which are two of the whitest zip codes in the entire country, two of the richest zip codes in the entire country, uh, and he won. Right now, we're uh, supporting a candidate in Portland, in Oregon, mm -hmm. Janelle Bynum. Oregon is not, I've been to Oregon several times, Oregon is not <laughs> the place where you're going to see a lot of black people. It's just not, not even in Portland. So, uh, and Janelle is an outstanding candidate that New Dems are getting behind, and so I think that 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 sort of old mindset that we have some in incredible candidates, some members of New Dam, some some not members of New Dam, that have showed that they can get elected in these tough districts, and New Dams are helping them just as much and more as uh, any of the other candidates that we're helping. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. I mean, and I think I I'll reiterate: you are starting to see black candidates winning in in non-black districts, and I'll, just to name a couple more, you know, Amelia Sykes, Marilyn Strickland, all of whom are. You know, members of the New Dem co Coalition um, are, you know, Blair, Un yeah, Lauren Underwood, uh, Joan Neguse, again, because we are looking at who is the candidate that best reflects the needs and is going to solve the problems of the people of that district. And now we have seen, you, we have a black caucus that is the largest ever. Now we are 60 members strong. And not all of us represent black districts. I am lucky enough to represent a, 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 black influence district. It's about 40% black. Um, but New Dems didn't come in and say, you know, are you a traditional candidate that can win this district? New Dems came in in my, in my primary and said, who has been working to help the people of this district, who reflects the needs of this district, who reflects the desires and, and ambitions of this district, and who is going to work to get things done? And they came in and endorsed me in a one-week primary. They didn't have to do that. They Well, thank you. Yes, you did. But, <laughs> you know, they could have said, they could have said in a primary this one week before Christmas, we're going to let y'all sort that out. But they saw the record that I had representing 
people in that district in the state legislature and they saw my opponent and his record and said, we need her and we know she's going to bring a perspective that has not been heard here in Congress where we only have 28 black women, 29 now with LaFonza Butler. And so we are working to make sure, and I'll, this is the only time you will hear me quote Kevin McCarthy. Okay. Kevin McCarthy said, standing up at the podium when he looked on the Democratic side, he saw a caucus that reflected the face of America. When he looked on the Republican side, he saw a monolith. That's what New Dem stands for. We are all working to make sure that we have a Congress that reflects the full diversity of the people that we govern. Beautiful. Great way to end. And I will say one of the best compliments for me is I now have uh, all kinds of members from all parts of our caucus coming up asking me about new Dems, asking me how to join new Dems. Um, but particularly, I'm proud of the growing um, influence in the CBC of new Dem members. You know, we can win these districts and um, we're going to win in November and we're really proud of the work we're doing. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.